What's good, y'all? What's good, Real Talk Squad? This is Miles, and you're listening to Real Talk with Miles Johnson, where you know we always keep it real. Let's get straight into it, man. I appreciate y'all, man. We got 12K followers on TikTok. We got 2K subscribers on YouTube, and we're about to hit 15K followers on Instagram. I appreciate the love. We've been rocking, and we also received an award at the Black Sports Business Symposium as a future leader in the sports industry, and it was myself under Real Talk with MJ, and I can't thank y'all enough for the support. And making this happen. So if you're new to Real Talk, like, comment, subscribe, join the Real Talk squad. And man, let's get straight into this episode. We're first going to talk about the Philadelphia Eagles. Now, Jalen Hurts made some noise. Jalen Hurts said that this offense will be 95% new. When I heard that, I rejoiced. I said, hallelujah. I said, thank you, God. Because what I saw last year with the debacle that Brian Johnson and Nick Sirianni, don't forget him, put on display offensively, I said we need to change everything we do. And the reason why it's 95% is because that 5% is for the tush push. But you need to scrap everything y'all did last season and you need to bring in motion you need to bring in using Devontae and AJ Brown in the middle of the field we need to bring back running the football these are all things that we did not see last year and I expect Kellen Moore who is a competent OC to get it done with this boatload of talent I mean if you're a competent OC and you get what this Eagles roster has and Saquon Barkley, Jalen Hurts, A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, Dallas Goddard. I mean, you have a boatload of riches at your disposal, Kellen Moore. And unless you're just not that guy, you mess this up. You can't. I could put up 25 points as their OC. I mean, I play some Madden. You feel me? Like, this offense at the worst, should be the third best offense in the league. It really should be number one, but I would definitely say that at the very worst, they'll be top three. So thank you, Jalen Hurts, for letting me get optimistic about this season because I see that we're not going to be doing everything that we were doing in the past. The new leaf has been turned, and Nick Sirianni, Stay away. Stay away. Another thing I want to note with this Eagles roster, have you noticed the camaraderie, the brotherhood in this Eagles roster during OTAs, during this offseason? I mean, you got guys doing push-ups, squats together. Nick Sirianni said that everybody – was at OTAs except Landon Dickerson, who had an excused absence. And when you talk about other teams in this league, unlike the Cowboys and CeeDee Lamb and these guys, unlike the Ravens with Lamar Jackson, the reigning MVP, not present, the the 49ers with Brandon Ayuk, he's sitting out. That camaraderie that you build early on lasts when you're in Week 11. Week 12, week 13, when you're coming off a bad loss, when you're coming off a time when maybe everything isn't as smooth. Because what was the Eagles' biggest problem last year? They weren't together. Well, this season, it's different. This season, you can feel it from the outside looking in. Oh, yeah, no, these guys are together. Everybody's on one accord, and everybody has that respect for each other. And it's a healthy discourse of like really competing i know you saw what Keenan mitchell said to aj brown when he was like that route was trash you know but it's also times when 
You know, A.J. Brown compliments the rookies, where Jalen Hurts is there and present for the rookies, right? Saquon Barkley, he's in the building. So we have a culture that is being built from day one, and this is important in the post-Kelsey, post, you know, Fletcher Cox era, where you have a team that everybody is on the same accord, and that brotherhood is one. The reason why the Eagles flamed out last season, it was because of talent. It was coaching, but a big part of it was the disconnect from coaching to the to the players. A big part of it was the disconnect between all the players. And there hasn't been somebody that has really said what really, really happened because I feel like it's something that we don't know behind the scenes that happened last season. But nonetheless, I see this team is completely different from last season, and I'm happy because we don't need a repeat of last season. I want to know A.J. Brown. I, I, I um mentioned him before. A.J. Brown looks like he's on a mission. No Diddy. He looked good, bro. He looked good. He looked in shape. No, no cap. And I think the way that he ended last season where – it was a whole thing with the Philly media, and it was that rift. And then in his last game he played, he fumbles the ball against the, the Giants, and we get blown out. I mean, that's a terrible way to go out. So I know A.J. Brown is on going to be on another level next season because he's using the end of last season as motivation. When he had one of his best years, if not his best year as a pro, but there's still room to improve, obviously. And he'll be more motivated than ever. And shout out to Howie Roseman for getting these deals done early. Unlike the Cowboys that still have to pay CeeDee Lamb. That still have to pay Dak Prescott. And if they paid these guys earlier, they wouldn't have been as expensive as they're going to be in the future. So Howie Roseman got this down to a science. When you talk about A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith aren't that much more combined in their salaries than Justin Jefferson. Think about that. Those two guys are only like, what, maybe $20 million over what Justin Jefferson makes in total? You feel what I'm saying? So that's a, that's a big thing, and that's a credit to Hyde Roseman and how he runs his shop. My only issue and... My only trepidation for the Eagles next season is their wide receiver depth. I'm not trying to put this in the air, but if something happens to AJ or Devontae, they, they're out for a couple of games or whatever, it's like, who's going to really step up? Who's going who's gonna to step up? I, I would have liked to bring back Alamadeus Zacchaeus. I, I mean, he was cool for me. I don't know about y'all. He was cool for me. But that might be the only weakness of this wide receiving core. But when you have Saquon Barkley in the backfield, I mean, like, I ain't going to be, I ain't going to be, you know, these are, like, wealthy problems. When you have an abundance of riches, these are problems that people or teams want to have. These are problems other teams want to have that the Eagles have right now when you have two number one wide receivers, but you're still like, well, shoot. We could use more wide receiver depth. That's where the Eagles are. So it's not a huge issue, but it's something to just keep an eye on. You feel me? If we can get a free agent, you know, for the low ski, I would definitely, you know, look into that closer to the season. I want to get into the NBA Finals. And I had Mavs in five. Now seeing what happened in game one, I'm definitely like, all right. Mavs in five might not be what is going to happen. I still got the Mavs winning. But I still feel good. Luka's getting his shots. The thing with Luka, what the Celtics will try to do is they want Luka to score but not get his assist. If Luka has 35 points and three assists, if he has 35 points and four assists, five assists, the Celtics will live with that. But what they can have is Luka 
having 30 points, 8 assists, 10 rebounds. Luka, 35, 10 assists, you know, 9 rebounds. You can't have that where he's getting other guys involved. Now, granted, the Mavericks were missing open shots. You can't do that. It's the finals. It's, it's prime time. You feel me? So you can't do that right now. Obviously, Kyrie Irving, he's got to play better. But superstars don't have back-to-back bad games. I'll say that again. Superstars, when they have bad games, they don't come back and replicate a bad game. I guarantee you, Kyrie Irving will have a sensational game too. Sensational. It will be night and day from game one to game two. Kyrie Irving is of that talent. He's of that ilk. That when he has a terrible game, he will bounce back. I think when you have a guy like Derek Lively and, you know, Daniel Gafford, obviously they struggled against Christoph Porzingis. But to combat that, you need to tire Christoph Porzingis out on the defensive end. You got to get him moving side to side. You got to get him exerting his energy. So whether that's you cutting in for lobs and having him try to contest, and, you know, if that just tires him out, you have to be able to force Jason Tatum to beat you. I'm so serious. I want, if I'm the Mavs, I want Jason Tatum to beat me. If Tatum outplays Luka or if Tatum goes toe-to-toe with Luka, you live with that. You live with that. But what you can't do is have Derek White go off and Christoph Porzingis go off like, nah, shut them guys down and force Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown to beat out your number twos. I mean, your duo. You want to force Tatum and Brown to beat Luka and Kyrie. That's the matchup. That's the matchup. That's what Jason Kidd should be looking at. We need to get, I mean, the Mavs need to rebound better, right? Need, need to rebound better. So that's it too. And P.J. Washington, obviously, he can't go 0 for on 3. He's going to have to be a huge piece for the Mavs if they want a chance in this series. Now, I'll give Joe Mazzulla his credit. They did a good job of, you know, getting Kristoff Porzingis in the right spots. I was a little bit nervous, the fact that Porzingis would be on the bench and all this stuff, but he came off the bench and was firing. So, Mazzulla... As much as I've criticized you, I'll give you credit for what you did in game one. But it's only game one. But shout out Jason Kidd. I'm going to say it again. Shout out Jason Kidd. Because he knows exactly what he's doing. He wants to, you know, put some dissension in that locker room. And Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, they can try to say that. They don't care about this best player title and all this stuff. And they don't care about being the best player on a championship roster and all that. But if Tatum hears what Jason Kidd said with talking about how Jalen Brown is the best player on the Celtics, in his mind, I predict Tatum is going to be like, oh, y'all disrespecting me. I'm about to prove to y'all why I'm that guy. And that might cause Tatum to take some ill-advised jumpers, to take some contested step-back three-point shots, which he is accustomed to doing. Tatum's the guy that, you know, he'll rather take a a contested jump shot instead of just getting to his spot early and hitting. You feel me? So this could be something that gets in Tatum's head to be like, I got to prove to y'all that I'm really that guy on this team. I'm really the best player. And if it gets to that point to where Tatum is trying to prove something and he's taking ill-advised shots that he normally wouldn't take at such a high clip, that could prove to be a detriment to the Celtics. And Tatum's also thinking about in his head, I have the chance to take the face of the league title potentially, or be in the conversation for best player in the world. You don't do that if Jalen Brown is your best player. You don't do that if you aren't even close to being the finals MVP. 
So what Tatum is also looking at is like if I ball out out of control and I prove to be the best player on the court and we win, that helps me a lot. Now, maybe Tatum is like, I don't care about that. All I care about is winning. He's on some Tim Duncan stuff where he's just like, hey, look, uh, you know, Duncan, it was times when Tony Parker, he won finals MVP. It was obviously times when Kawhi Leonard won finals MVP. So maybe he doesn't care about that. And look, that's a great trait to have because you got a guy like Tim Duncan who's got five rings. But Jason Tatum is like, what you want to do, bro? What you want to do? And he's not that type of talent, I believe, that he can just start forcing up shots, if I feel like. You feel what I'm saying, bro? So we're going to see. But I love the fact that Jason Kidd is trying to put some dissension in that Celtics locker room. And let's see. Let's see if that works out. My last two topics, we're going to talk about Caitlin Clark being left off of Team USA. This was a dumb move. A dumb move. And here we go again with women's basketball dropping the ball. I firmly believe Kaylin Clark right now is better than Sabrina Inescu. 100%. If if you gave Kaylin Clark Brianna Stewart, what are we talking about? What are we talking about? Because from day one, from day one, Kaylin Clark has to do everything. She has to pass. She has to score. And she, she got a rebound, too. So she's doing all of that on a bottom feeder team. All right, put that into perspective. But then it's like, when you're playing with these great players, imagine Caitlin Clark in a pick and roll with Asia Wilson. We're, what are we talking about? So I heard something that Team USA was nervous about the public's reaction because Caitlin Clark has so many fans and they'll be kind of upset if she's on Team USA and not getting a lot of minutes. Imagine the pick and rolls with Asia Wilson and or Brianna Stewart with Kaylin Clark. What are we talking about, bro? What are we talking about? You put her on there, and not only will she be a great facilitator, a great shooter, but also she will drive ratings. The ratings will be better. Or oh, I'll say this. The ratings would have been better with Caitlin Clark on Team USA versus without her. Now, it'll drive some ratings, but it's not going to be astronomical the way that it would have been with Caitlin Clark. And you got to think, you're trying to ultimately make this a global game. You want Caitlin Clark on the biggest stage. It's dumb. It's dumb. Like, it doesn't make any sense. And then they have Caitlin Clark in the beginning of her rookie season going against the Connecticut Sun twice, the Liberty. It's like, how about you have her face some teams that aren't that good so she's going crazy and that builds up a lot of hype. Now, there's still going to be hype around her and there's still going to be eyes around her. But it's like you see in the NFL, are they having Caleb Williams play the 49ers or the Chiefs in his first three weeks? Are they having him play the best teams in the league when he first comes into the league? No. They're having him play teams that aren't that good so he, so he can build his confidence up and ultimately it can drive the sport to, uh, to higher heights. It's facts. So I just don't get it, bro. They, they just don't get it. They simply don't get it. So who cares if Kaylin Clark's fans would be upset if she isn't getting that much playing time? That's what happens when you have a popular sport. You're going to have fans with strong opinions. So it's like y'all ask for more fans to the sport. And then when the fans come, you don't know how to react. You don't know how to react. I'm going to say it again. You don't know how to react when you have different opinions. That's all it is. It's called sports. When Ben Simmons could not shoot a three-point shot 
And to this day, he doesn't shoot three-point shots. He gets cooked. Giannis at the free throw line. People were literally counting when he's on the free throw line. He had to battle through and get through that adversity. So in sports, you got to battle through adversity. Fans are going to have crazy opinions, crazy takes. But that's the trade-off if you want to be more popular. If you don't want to be popular and you want a small percentage of people watching your sport, then yeah, it's going to be all good. You know, not that much different, you know, opinions and all that stuff. But if you want to actually build the sport to a global superpower, what do you need to do? Highlight and put your biggest stars and the face of your franchise on the biggest stage. Like, it's just dumb. It's simply dumb. So I'll say it again. Caitlin Clark is better right now than Sabrina Inescu. And I know some old WNBA fans are going to be upset. I don't care. I see what I see with my own two eyes. And I know if Caitlin Clark was on the Liberty, she would be doing far better than Sabrina. It's just facts, bro. It's simply just facts. All right, my last point. We talk about the, the Phillies real quick. Talk about the Phillies. They're rolling. They are a World Series contender, and they should be the favorite to come out of the National League. Now, the biggest reason why, they got four of the top six pitchers in ERA in the National League. That is crazy. Zach Wheeler, Aaron Nola, Christopher Sanchez, Ranger Suarez have been dealing this season. They've been cooking, bro. Flat out cooking. And so I look forward to what they'll do in the postseason. And I look forward to this batting lineup. Sosa cooking. Bryce Harper cooking. Schwarber has started off a little bit slow, but I know he will be cooking. Casty is finding his rhythm. Hey, look. Trey Turner, he's injured right now. We aren't missing him at all. So I very much am looking forward to what the Phillies do. It's getting a little bit boring now because I just know they're going to get a win and another win and, an, and another win. So it's pretty much boring now because the in inevitable is that they will get to the World Series. But, you know, it's definitely something that you want to keep an eye on and just point out how scary this team looks. And I'll say, too, the way that the Phillies treated Reese Hoskins is proof that Phillies fans aren't that bad after all. All you got to do is have some heart, bro. Have some heart. If you have heart, Philly fans won't boo you. Philly fans won't, you know, act crazy. You got to think, when have the Phillies fans, well, I'll, take the, I'll, take, I'll, I'll say this. When have Philadelphia fans booed a player who had heart? They never booed Jimmy Butler. They never booed Jalen Hurts. They never booed Bryce Harper. Now, they might have booed the teams they were on, but they never booed those individual players. Now, they've booed Ben Simmons. Now, they've booed Joel Embiid. They've booed Carson Wentz. It's a difference between having heart and not having heart. A guy like Reese Hoskins, who is now on a totally different team and is getting a standing ovation, just shows you if you have heart, Philly fans will embrace you whether you are a current player, a past player, or are currently a player, but you aren't longer, you, you aren't on the team anymore. It's just a fact. So I look forward to what the, the Phillies will do. I look forward to what the Eagles will do. I'm annoyed by the Caleb Clark situation, and I still got Mavs in five. Like, comment, subscribe, do all that jazz. I love y'all. Peace.